Hello, everybody, and welcome to our listening sessions from a multicultural lens. My name is James Hackett Little, and I'm the executive assistant here at CPIN. Before we jump into this session, I am excited, excited to announce our zine winners. Now, I want to share with you a little bit about the zine winners. Uh, in honor or in honor of our theme, we ask community members to submit their responses to questions. What does the right to heal mean to you? And over the last few months, we received many submissions, 10 of which were selected as winners. Their artistic submissions were judged on creativity, embodiment of the event theme, and clarity. Now, without further ado, I have the pleasure of announcing our winners. Our winners are Nancy K. Hernandez Ferreria, Sierra J. Ortega Moore, Sherilyn Magalanes, Daisy B. Marino, Sequoia Olivia Mercer, Naili V. Alex Polish, Delgreda Brown, Kayla Coulter, and K. M. Cabrea. Congratulations and enormous gratitude to all of the people who submitted their art. The winners will be receiving a $500 Visa gift card for winning their submission. Additionally, everyone will receive a digital copy of the Zine booklet. You can check it out here and congratulations to our winners. CPIN staff will be putting a link to the Zine in the chat and the Zine will also be available on our website after the event. Now, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce Stephanie Franco, who will be moderating the the panel. Now, a little bit about Stephanie. She's born and raised in the Bay Area and as a community advocacy manager at the California Pan Ethnic Health Network, her work focuses on rebuilding mental health institutions that are historically overlooked and have harmed communities of color, the LGBTQIA plus community, and people with disabilities. Take it away, Steph. Thank you so much, James, for that warm introduction. And welcome again, everyone, to this session. I have the pleasure of facilitating this next portion and also introducing our two speakers. But before we jump in, I wanted to give a little bit of context. CPEN and California Black Women's Health Project are presenting in the afternoon because their listening sessions had a focus on the multicultural experience and they held it in one of the most diverse counties. Of all the local partners, this local partner also looked exclusively at the multicultural experience in Los Angeles. So to wrap up this event, we really wanted to spotlight their findings and learnings and I have the honor of introducing these two incredible people. The first one is Sonia Young Adam. She is a University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business graduate. In 2014, Sonia joined California Black Women's Health Project as a CEO. She has a deep passion for overall health and uplifting Black women and families. And her most important work in the past 10 years has consisted of supporting transformative interventions in underserved urban communities, especially in South Los Angeles, where she was born and raised. So everyone give some love in the chat for Sonia. Next, I want to introduce Divinity Motovu, who has over 15 years of experience in entrepreneurship, tech, nonprofit management. Divinity holds an MBA in finance and entrepreneurial management also from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. She holds her BA in political science and African-American studies from USC. And in 2015, Divinity also founded MBAMama.com, check them out, to empower career moms and help women navigate family planning and career planning. MBA Mama is now one of the world's largest professional networks dedicated exclusively to MBA moms. So shout out to both of them, drop some love in the chat and I will pass it off to you both to kick us off for this session. Wow, Stephanie, thank you so much. It is, it's, it's a real honor to work with you. Um, I am so glad that you were in place at CPEN and I appreciate this partnership with the organization so much. We are, you know, really um, centered and you'll hear this shortly around collaboration and we believe very strongly at California Black Women's Health Project that collaboration is essential to developing and designing and pushing agendas that support and uplift you know our various communities to to be better so um, as Stephanie said I am um, Sonia Young Adam CEO of California Black Women's Health Project and it has been really an incredible um, 
summit today, uh, it has really felt um, very rich, um, very honest, um, and also, um, you know, very humble. Um, it's I, I've appreciated that you know the previous speakers today have, you know, given us an opportunity to go really deep into. Um, you know, their own sessions and what they have done around this work in, you know, he, um, healing and health and mental health and access. I mean, I, I want to give a special shout out to um, uh, the sister from uh, Our Joy. And I mean, you know, just that team and what they've done in, in Oakland is just amazing. And so I hope to have the opportunity to meet and work with them at some point. But let me just tell you just very quickly about California Black Women's Health Project. I mean, you can certainly go to our website and learn more and see, you know, all of the um, imagery and videos of the work that we are doing. So the organization is very much grown now. We always say, you know, 27. I mean, you're doing like, you know, major things at this point. Um, but we are the only statewide, California statewide organization that's solely committed to the health and wellness of Black women and girls. And our work is centered around the strategies of advocacy, outreach, policy, and education. And we are unapologetically, you know, working to improve and uplift and um, you know just make better the health and wellness of, of black women the 1.2 million of us in california why do we center black women and girls and why do we center black women in particular is because we believe in our communities that black women tend to be um, the health heads of our families we're the administrative heads uh, administrative heads of our families and even all too often we're the heads of our families so you know we carry an inordinate burden and responsibility um, to really carry our community and support our communities for better health and wellness so and I mean, you can move the slide. Thank you. I'm glad to know that somebody's out there. Um, the areas of our work that I just want to highlight very quickly, you know, clearly mental health. I mean, I learned uh, about, I guess it's about eight years ago um, at a session, you know, about this approach to a health, a health and all approach. This is from a professor at USC. And, you know, as I've, you know, grown in this work, you know, I really now focus on a mental health and all approach, the mental health of our of our of our lives of our of in our case our sisters you know our brothers our families you know um in the state of california is richly um you know dependent upon safety access you know all of the things that we are advocating um for here today and as a part of this partnership with cpin that we've been able to you know really lift up in a multicultural way which is a unique space for us but one that we're excited about um and then our work is also centered in hiv and aids um, violence prevention. We have a program called Anti-Violence Ventures. You can certainly check that out on our website. Our maternal and infant health work is centered around, you know, you know, supporting joyous and safe births for black uh, black moms and babies. And then there's our work around aging, which we're doing a great uh, partnership with uh, SAGE, Sisters Aging with Grace and Elegance. And I'm excited about that. Our values for the organization, I mentioned one of them that we are, um, you know, black women centered and that's unapologetic and clearly equity, which, you know, everyone in this space today, I mean, we're clearly aligned in our um, active pursuit of, of equity and justice across all areas of health and wellness in our communities in California. Um, and then we are, you know, we move ourselves as a lever of change, a change in conditions, a change in policies, a change in, you know, behaviors and norms, um, you know, that impact our health. And then, of course, collaboration. And, you know, we've already talked about that. Um, for mental health, the organization has developed a couple of really awesome programs that I'm really proud of. And one of them is our Sisters Mentally Mobilized program. It's supported by the uh, California Department of Public Health through the California Reducing Disparities Project. And it is a program that, it, that embodies and, and pulls together two of the central ways in which we do our work. So we use a sister circle model of engagements. It's an evidence-based practice. You can look it up. Um, it, you know, it's been around for a long time and we utilize that sister circle model and we meld that with an advocate training um, program that the organization um, has been doing for a long time. And so we bring in black women and we train them through this program to be mental health advocates and activists. And we are training them so that they can stand 
in the gap in those places and spaces in our state, in our communities, where there is difficulty, as we have already talked about, you've heard it all day, where there is difficulty accessing, you know, not even just quality mental health care, but even just accessing care and certainly care that is, you know, culturally rich, care that recognizes who we are, care that acknowledges, you know, our our history and our past, care that even, you know, is 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 willing to acknowledge that there is, you know, a history of structural and systemic racism um, in this country that, you know, continues to traumatize us. We don't, we're not even healing from that because we continue to experience, you know, those levels of racism, you know, as we walk move, play, work, you know, in, in all of the spaces that we tend to navigate um, across the state. So um, the Sisters Mentally Mobilized Program is designed, you know, to build really uh, an army of Black women who are, you know, engaged, who are active, who are mobilizing in their communities, who are working to, to help their communities and their networks, their spheres of influence navigate, you know, spaces and places and to, you know, connect themselves to, you know, better mental health care and to hold space um, in, in the form of sister circles or other safe affirming spaces so that Black women can come together to deal, heal, um, and, and, um, and, and, and work through, you know, some of our historical trauma, you know, the ongoing stresses and abuses, um, you know, the absence of, you know, um, the quality care that, that we should be getting. Um, to date, we have trained a hundred <laughs> black women um, in the state of California in the five areas of the state where there's the largest population. And that's the five large counties that you'd be certainly aware of. And I'm just excited about that program. We also have a model of the program now that we've created called Stylist Mentally Mobilized, where we are training black women hairstylists to be first responders and to be mental health advocates and activists as well. Um, but I'm so excited that we can now introduce to you the work that um, we've done with CPAN and the multicultural listening sessions and, and that work. And I'd love for Divinity to share it with you. And I wanna also tell you, you heard Divinity's quick bio, um, but Divinity is, is working with us as a, as a consultant and we are so honored you know, to have her heart, brain, and soul, you know, connected to this work. And I'm just so proud of her and what she's accomplished with this. And she'll tell you all about the elements that we use. And I'm just excited. And if there are any questions, put them in the chat. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the kind words. Um, so I am honored to be here today. And um, I know those of you who have been on all day heard from Dr. Jamila Young. Dr. Young was actually my personal therapist uh, for over a year um, and she is just phenomenal. So I'm so glad that she was able to uh, bless <laughs> this space earlier. Um, so I'm excited to recap our work. Um, as you can see, we actually brought Dr. Jamila Young into the fold uh, when we launched Mental Health Matters Culture as a Social Determinant back in October 2020. We were knee deep in the pandemic and we were like, okay, we gotta go multicultural in LA County and be virtual. Oh Lord. <laughs> and so it was a big challenge because um, you know, we had to really figure out the proper outreach. Um, and so one of the first things I did was actually to have a targeted strategy um, that included outreach to key demographics uh, within LA County. And so I looked, tapped into my personal network, Sonia's network, the organization's network, as well as literally Googling what organizations are working on mental health um, and you know, are in the Black, American Indian, Latinx, Indigenous, Korean American, et cetera, communities. And so this list here, um, this is not even a full comprehensive list, but um, this is just a, a highlight of some of the groups that we reached out to. And basically, I just uh, reached out cold and said, hey, this is what we're doing. We're planning this event in October. It's virtual. This is the focus. We would love for you to share this with your members and uh, your patients and the people who are you know, on your mailing list. And we got a wonderful, wonderful response. Um, we also incentivize folks <laughs> with gift cards as well. So that model works <laughs> um, and people were excited. Next slide, please. 
So um, the October 2020 convening, uh, we had a total attendance of 60 participants via Zoom. Um, and you can see here kind of the overall purpose of the kickoff event. This is uh, what we publicized to uh, the multicultural groups who are going to join us. And it was really important for us that we had people of multi multiple different ethnicities ethnicities to actually be on camera speaking during the event. Um, and we wanted representation from the LA County Department of Mental Health. And so uh, a wonderful sister, African-American woman, Theon Perkins, joined us for the event. Um, and really, you know, sometimes it can be difficult for DMH to get in front of the community and kind of defend their track record. Um, and Theon was very gracious. She shared with us some of the pivots that DMH has made during the pandemic. Um, and she was very open to feedback, critical feedback from some of the people who participated in our event. Uh, we also had a keynote uh, speech from Dr. Jamila Young, who you heard from earlier, um, and she addressed anti-Blackness and institutional racism within the mental health system. Um, although she did focus on anti-Blackness, she also knew that this was a multicultural event. And so we talked about racism as an institutional barrier for um, Black and, you know, for indigenous folks, um, Asian American communities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one of the highlights that uh, she actually talked about was, I remember earlier someone on this call actually talked about saging and smudging as like an ancestral practice. And I just love that example. One example that Dr. Jamila gave during her keynote was, um, you know, this idea of communing with our ancestors and connecting with ancestral spirits. And someone without, a, a practitioner without the proper cultural context might misconstrue that and might think, oh, are you hearing voices? You know, and it may lead to some misdiagnosis or something. And these are the institutional barriers that our communities face. Um, and so it was a wonderful keynote address. Um, and we think the folks in the audience, no matter what race or ethnicity they were from, were definitely able to um, take some value out of what she had to say. Next slide, please. So um, after the event, we followed up with a comprehensive mental health toolkit. We partnered with CPEN on this. Um, the toolkit is extensive. I think maybe it was made, the link was made available to the people on this call. I'm not entirely sure. Um, Stephanie can let us know that. Um, but the link is live and available. Um, maybe we can drop it in the chat um, if it hasn't been uh, disseminated. But this is a great way to really follow up and provide some concrete resources uh, for the multicultural folks who joined us in October. And Divinity, just so you know, the toolkit is also available on our website. So if you just look up Black California Black Women's Health Project, you'll find the toolkit there as well. Wonderful. Thanks, Sonia. Next slide. Great. So a few months later, it was time for our community listening session. Um, and so we wanted to um, make sure that community members really had a platform, even though we were virtual, to discuss their personal unique experiences accessing mental health services throughout LA County. So not just city of LA, but you know everywhere from Lancaster down to Long Beach. Um, and so we had 80 participants via Zoom um, and our session was facilitated by a psychologist, psychologist Griffin Thompson. Um, and basically we had several questions, prompt questions um, that Griffin would, you know, share out to the audience. And then we just let people unmute themselves and kind of chime in. We also broke up the event um, by having performances uh, by Dangeli Rodriguez del Orb. She's a Afro-Dominican spoken word poet who shared some beautiful poetry uh, that was actually the themes of the poems were related to mental health. Um, and then Brenda Azusana is a Mexican doula and wellness expert who led a guided med meditation for us as well. Next slide. 
All right, so there's a lot of text here, but I'll just kind of talk about the um, the big picture key highlights. Um, so definitely folks, um, themes that came up throughout the community listen, listening session were finding a therapist or a practitioner who looks like you um, and understands your culture and language, whether that be slang um, or your literal <laughs> language, uh, Spanish, Korean, Hmong, et cetera. Um, additionally, folks talked about um, needing providers of color um, to really get support themselves because they're sometimes overwhelmed um, because there just aren't enough of them available. Um, and I know that that's something even Dr. Jamila would attest to. Additionally, we talked about the fact that multi um, these multicultural providers um, are also at a higher risk of vicarious trauma, given the high rates of severe and chronic trauma as a result of being marginalized due to their own race and ethnicity. Um, additionally, underfunding, I'm sure that's something we all can attest and relate to. Um, and then kind of going along with that, it's like literally sometimes the physical spaces where these practitioners are providing therapeutic services may look bleak, dingy, in disrepair, and just not warm and inviting, not a place that feels safe where you can go and feel like you're, you have some dignity. Um, and sometimes that may stop people from even walking through the door. Um, also, we talked about microaggressions um, and, you know, the fact that, again, that's a hurdle that may stop people from even getting through to that first appointment. And then lastly, um, overly technical language, you know, by therapists and psychiatrists that is just um, not approachable can also be a big barrier. And all of these highlights, these are things that people on the community listening session call were articulating. And, and people were sharing their own personal examples. We were a little concerned that we might not get a lot of people to actually speak up because this, this topic can be deeply personal. But um, I think we set a really good tone in our October event. And so by the time we were ready to do our community listening session, there was already a track record of success and of us creating this safe space virtually so that uh, when May 2021 came around, we really had a lot of great participation. Um, and it was like the chat was blowing up and we didn't have a dull moment of silence. You know, people were very uh, willing to share their stories. Next slide. Great. And so um, as we came back to the drawing board, we wanted to follow up with recommendations like, you know, like the Bible says, faith without works, <laughs> you know, we needed to follow up and we wanted to make recommendations to um, our colleagues at the Department of Mental Health and let them know these are the things that we heard and these are some recommendations that we have. Um, and so we kind of combined all the data that we got uh, from both the October event as well as the May event. Um, and these are the recommendations that we made. I'm sure some of you um, probably have similar recommendations in your counties outside of LA, but definitely more inclusion is needed. An easy low hanging fruit we thought would be gender identities. You know, just having male, female is not it's not going to cut it in 2021. Um, also making the website uh, more accessible and easier to navigate uh, was also, again, this is low hanging fruit. It doesn't take some big, you know, funding infusion to make these small changes. Additionally, um, the LA County Department of Mental Health 800 number, we thought there should be an option for people to select uh, their language and to be able to listen in their own language. And, you know, just having Spanish as the only other option, again, this is not going to cut it in 2021, especially for a county that is as, is as diverse as Los Angeles. 
Additionally, we saw more intentional collaboration with grassroots organizations um, and the communities within LA County is definitely needed. Training for newer stakeholders, um, and then also openly considering community feedback when making decisions. And, you know, walking the walk and talking the talk. And finally, we thought LA County DMH should invest in culturally specific organizations and stop the practice of underfunding. This is easier said than done, <laughs> as we know. Uh, but you know, we have to keep having these conversations and continuing um, to push. Um, and then finally, making their application and contracting process more accessible um, and considering what technical assistance and payment schedules might be needed to better support these organizations. Again, these are not recommendations that are going to take some multi-year strategic plan and a huge funding infusion. These are simple things that DMH could do literally in the next six months. Next slide. I think that's it for me, right? Um, so I will pass it back to you, Stephanie. Well, you know, bef before you go on, Stephanie, just, if, I know we just have a, are we done or do we have another minute or so? Just so. Yeah, so we have about five minutes left. So yeah, go ahead, Sonia. And okay. thank you so much, Divinity. Yes, Divinity, thank you. I mean, I, I definitely um, appreciate you reiterating that the recommendations, you know, are not so onerous, that they could not be implemented. Um, and they should, and, and when, when there is a discussion about implementing them, that the community should be actively engaged along with the county um, in, in putting these in place. You know, I also want to add that, you know, for most of what, you know, um, multicultural communities are doing across the state, you know, we are creating community defined practices that we are utilizing. I, and I heard it, you know, earlier um, from, you know, I think it's the Mom, Mom Cultural Center in Butte County. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, Miss uh, uh, Jody Geddes from Our Joy, you know, what they, what we are doing and they are doing is, you know, utilizing our history, our culture, our heritage, to support our communities. And it's it's that it's what's happening where we are filling these gaps. And so the counties across the state, and I mean, we see what's happening now with COVID where we're all having to work so closely together in order to ensure, you know, some measure of, of safety, um, you know, from, from uh, that virus. And counties and the state have had to rely very heavily on community-based organizations. And so an infusion and investment in community-based organizations um, has, is pretty proven effective now and even around mental health and improving our physical health, you know, I believe very strongly that our systems should more closely align themselves with these community defined practices, CDEPs as we call them, CDEPs, um, as a way to um, support better mental health, better health and wellness for, um, you know, black, indigenous, you know, and other communities of color. Yeah, definitely. And I think more of these spaces are necessary, especially when we come together as multicultural communities, even in Los Angeles County, right? And even being in the planning process with you all and talking about this and putting together the toolkit and the, the specific questions, it all made sense, like how much these spaces are really needed. Um, and we do have a question from the audience that I wanted to share with you both from Luna uh, Hernandez Ramirez. And Luna asks, how did the team decide what topics needed to get addressed at the gatherings? Good question. Divinity, do you want to talk about that or do you want yes. me to? Yes, I can jump in. Um, so for the first event, we really let the speakers decide. We told them the theme and we told them to stay on theme, but uh, we were very open to letting the Department of Mental Health kind of set their own agenda and the key points that they wanted to address. Uh, we did review with them in advance the presentation so that we made sure that it wasn't completely off base or that they were pushing some agenda that did not align with our strategic goals. Um, and same thing with uh, Dr. Jamila Young. We let her know she was the keynote speaker for that event we let her know, you know, what the theme was, and she sent us kind of an outline of her remarks in advance. And um, so we knew that we were on point. With the community listening session, 
we, um, as part of our registration process, I believe that we um, let people submit questions in advance um, that they wanted to wanted us to address. And so some questions we saw come up time and time again. And so we were like, yes, that one, we definitely need to make it um, a part of the, the main program. Um, and then also some things came up during the chat. And when, if we had extra time, we also um, addressed those questions as well. And I wanted to add one thing, unless there's another question in the chat, I wanted to just add one more thing because some of what we've heard today um, that, you know, goes beyond kind of like, you know, we've talked about, you know, recommendations that can be more easily um, implemented. Um, you know, one, one recommendation based on something that I heard earlier um, from one of the um, speakers, and I think it was um, in the, uh, Native American community in the Central Valley, um, you know, and and this this person talked about the the different the difficulties and challenges with you know accessing physical spaces to go and get care, you know, and showing up for spaces and transportation and all of the things that we're you know also aware of, um, you know, I I would love it if at some point we can begin to talk about you know what can we do you know at county levels to bring the services to the people you know where they are. Um, you know, in, in black communities, you know, I, I, I would go on record to say, you know, we are a tend and befriend kind of people. I mean, you, we, we, we probably do more things together, you know, than we might be willing to do apart. We can do group care and, and you know, uh, you know, group models of care, I think, could work very well in our communities. And, you know, if you don't have to go to a place where there's a shabby furniture and the you know, you, when you walk up to the facility, you don't feel welcome. You don't feel like it's a place for you. How about we bring, you know, practitioners into the community? And if you're working side by side with a trusted community-based partner, you know, your ability to probably have a greater impact on providing care um, is there. And I know there are HIPAA issues, there are, you know, all kinds of scope of practice issues. But I mean, I think those are things that, you know, if we can, if we have leaped into telehealth care, you know, the way we have because of COVID, the doors are open for other innovative um, ideas for bringing mental health care to our communities. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, thank you for adding that, Sonia. And Divinity, you also have one more thing. Yes, uh, one thing I wanted to note that we did during the first event uh, that really went over well with the community. We, um, and Stephanie actually was a big part of this, we did um, a land acknowledgement, um, and this is, I'm, I'm, I don't wanna get the language wrong, um, but it was basically a way for us to acknowledge um, that we are on stolen land, right? Um, and that there were indigenous peoples in California where we were way before we came along and we wanted to honor that and hold space for that. And it was just a very beautiful way to acknowledge um, our American Indian and indigenous colleagues that were on the call um, and to just be very intentional about the fact that although we are California Black Women's Health Project, our mandate in this work with Kingpin is to have a multicultural lens on what we're doing. Yes. Um, and so we really, I think, set the tone with that. And we were, I thought, very respectful. We did our research. Um, and we're very careful with like the language that was chosen. And Stephanie was actually the one who did the land acknowledgement and it was beautiful. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much Divinity um, for reminding me about that moment, right? <laughs> because it feels like such a long time ago. So I really wanna thank you both. Um, it's been such a joy to work together. You both are such a powerhouse, fierce leaders in the community, and I really admire you and appreciate you. And it's such an honor to just like hear you all speak about everything that you have done this past year. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. And thank you, Karen and the whole CPEN team. We really appreciate you all. All right, so next up, I want to invite our policy director, Carolina Valle, to share a little bit about the Right to Heal Mental Health Community Report. 
Great. Um, I'm going to try and keep this as brief because we have Senator Skinner, Skinner um, joining us um, and they're going to talk about their work on mental health. So thank you so much, Senator, for joining. We're going to put you on in just a minute before um, I just want to give a big um, shout out to the Right to Heal report. Um, this report is called the Right to Heal Mental Health in Diverse Communities. And we published this report in partnership with the five local partners and five state partners you heard about, you heard from earlier today. Um, you just heard a snapshot of the listening sessions, but this report goes into greater detail about each community's mental health experience. And on the right here, I pulled an assortment of what you can find in the report for each of the listening sessions. Detailed summaries of when the listening sessions happened and how many people participated. County access data where the listening sessions were held. And then the report is also full of really um, poignant quotes from community members. Um, and here's one that I really love from um, one of the community members that participated in the Hmong mental health session. And this person said, um, I would like policymakers and stakeholders and providers to hire mom staff members so it won't be so stressful to find an interpreter when we go to seek services. A lot of providers don't have mom speaking staff, so we are afraid to seek services because we don't know how to explain our struggles or issues. Um, here's another um, beautiful quote um, from a participant in the Reimagining Black Mental Health Listening Sessions in Alameda County. Um, they shared that the outer experience of a person does not dictate what they are experiencing. You can also check out a full appendix of mental health bills that were passed this last year. Um, what partners did after the event to educate decision makers about their listening sessions and how counties and policymakers can authentically move stakeholder engagement from just an informing process to an empowering experience. So check out this report online. It's on CPEN's website under publications um, in mental health. And um, next up, I would like to introduce uh, Senator Skinner. Um, please join the screen. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so happy you could join us. And, you know, I'm just going to pass the mic directly to you to introduce yourself. We've got a mix of um, community members, CBOs, um, policymakers, and um, State Department officials on this call. So if you could share about five minutes of remarks, we'd love to hear from you what your work in mental health looks like. Certainly. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be able to join you. And thank you for convening this um, gathering and this conversation because it's very needed. Um, and I'm really, really happy that there is a pan-ethnic network that's focused on this because uh, I don't know what word to use. I don't know whether to use tragically. I don't know whether to use, um, you know, utter, utter policy failure. But our carceral system, our jails and our prisons are now our primary mental health system. And when you look at who is in our jails and our prisons disproportionately, our um, residents of color disproportionately. And so number one, there's already the racial lens that of uh, you know whose system impacted and then that they are in a setting like that as the setting to, to deal with their mental health issues when it's not designed for that purpose at all. Um, we're, I think the awareness of that is growing amongst policymakers and amongst the uh, state staff and such. The, the awareness and the actual change in terms of programmatically and policy-wise is not fully gelled yet, but we're, we're in that transition and we need your input, your support, and your help to do the type of transition to get the policies right, to get the programs right, and to fix that issue. But what we did in the, I'm very fortunate to be the California State Senate Budget Chair. And this year, we funded some pretty important initiatives. We funded the 811 system to create a pathway so that services would be provided for a non police response versus a um, mental, uh, a non police response and instead a mental health response. 
We also funded a whole new initiative on child um, behavioral health, children's behavioral health, uh, which our um, director of health and human services, Dr. Golly, was uh, very instrumental in championing. And of course, um, in the last two years, we made very significant decision to move our juvenile, what was the Department of Juvenile Justice, out of the entire correction system and into health and human services, giving it a name change and recognizing that young people that are criminal system impacted, that they're not hardened criminals and that we need to approach their care from a trauma-based, trauma-based, uh, mental health-based, um, education-based, we need to approach it very, very differently so that we can give those young people the best chance at, at uh, healing and becoming full, full healthy participants in our um, communities and our neighborhoods and not in a criminal system. So we're moving in that direction, but of course we have you know more to do. And we also provided funding to our community colleges, 30 million to boost up their mental health services. Um, and to our uh, CSUs, 15 million for to boost up their mental health services. Um, and uh, the, I think you all may have been involved in advocating for the California Reducing Disparities Project. We funded that at 63 million. So we, you know, we made some progress budgetarily, but now we're going to have to make sure that the um, that our approaches and our policy that they reflect what our values in the budget reflected, and we're gonna need your input and really appreciate being your partner. Thank you so much, Senator Skinner, for giving us that global overview of um, some of the initiatives that um, have been passed in mental health this last mm -hmm. year, um, some of the issues that you have championed. You are correct, a lot of the organizations that are part of this conference are either um, organizations um, in the California Reducing Disparities Project or organizations that are doing similar types of community-defined mm -hmm. mental health. So thank you so much for all of your work on these issues. I know that our stakeholders and our community members are really invested in um, ensuring the, the full um, implementation of those programs and services, and we're really, really thankful for um, you being a mental health champion in the legislature. Um, and we've got some orgs that are in your district too, like uh, our joy, shout out to our joy there in parts of Alameda County. So um, if you're not connected with them, we're, we'd be happy to do that. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to now um, um, ask our tech person um, to exit you, Senator Skinner off the stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah. And, um, and now I'm going to direct everybody to the yellow stage. <laughs> We're really going to the yellow stage this time. Um, and there you will meet um, our um, Kieran, um, who's going to introduce, I believe, well, I don't want to misspeak which staff person it is, but we're going to do another raffle and we're going to do a guided meditation and a closing. So um, I'll see you all on the yellow stage.